It's weird. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who will talk about the importance of using evidence-based theory-informed media messages and campaigns. This is, the sub this is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because it's by using evidence-based messages, messages that we can promote healthy behaviors and pre prevent initiation of substance use, lead people to treatment, and reduce likelihood of relapse. Our speaker, Dr. William Crano, is the OSCAM Distinguished Professor and Chair of Psychology at Claremont Graduate University. His work has focused principally uh, on research methodology and persuasion, most recently on developing models of social influence in drug prevention. His fieldwork has been supported for the past 20 years by the US National Institute on drug abuse. It is concerned with the application of principles of persuasion in preventing drug misuse in children and adolescents. He was the founder and director of the Center for Evaluation and Assessment at Michigan State University, directed the Public Policy Resources Laboratory of Texas A&M University, and was head of the Department of Communication at the University of Arizona. Outside the academy, he served as the program director in social psychology for the National Science Foundation as liaison scientist for the, for the Office of Naval Research, London as NATO senior science, scientist, University of Southampton, and was Fulbright Fellow to the Federal University in Porto Alegre, Brazil. He, he has written, edited 22 books, more than 50 book chapters, and more than 400 scholarly articles and scientific present, presentations. He is the past chairman of the Society for Experimental so Social Psychology and is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the, Amer the American Psychological Society, the Western Psycho Psychological Association, and the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. He has served, he has served on many reviews panel for the National Institute of Health, advisor to the White House and Surgeon General on substance abuse issues and served as an advisor to the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and the U.S. State Department, INL, the Colombo Plan and Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, CCAD, of the Organization of America State, OAS. Before starting, please note that this webinar is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or treatment advice. The views presented here are those of the speaker and not necessarily those of ISIL. For the Q&A, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And please submit your question on the question box. As for the webinar as well, this session will be recorded. We gladly present to you Dr. William Crano. It is a great honor to have you with us today and to be enlightened with your knowledge and insight about today's topic. Please, Dr. William, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anthony. And, uh, thank you for that nice introduction. It was uh, more than I, 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 I've been busy when I was younger, I guess. Um, let me get rid of the, move this over a bit or something. Um, oh, crap, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to show the main screen. Okay, maybe Anthony, you can help me get back to where I wanted to be. Um, it is, let's see, oh, I see what I'm doing. Okay. Let me see. Wow. There we go. Okay. It's an honor to be here today and, and, uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity to present some information to you. So let's get started. Um, we have a major campaign that had been run for 
about six years in the United States, uh, actually longer than that. Uh, but during the time from 1998 to 2002, we spent $1.4 billion on that campaign. Despite what we did, and what they tried to do was to hit every possible communication medium possible with strong prevention ads uh, aimed at adolescents, 12 to 18 year, year olds, uh, focused mostly on cannabis, alcohol, uh, and inhaled drugs. These are drugs that in the United States, youngsters typically start out using. Sometimes go on to other things, sometimes not. This expenditure of money, they, they literally plastered every medium they could find for four solid years. We had great, they had great exposure. The problem was at, at the end of the four years of intensive media campaigning, what they found was that the net impact of that whole campaign was that more exposure was associated with weaker anti-drug norms and increases in the perceptions that other kids use marijuana, that other adolescents used it, that it was more common, more normative than not, than before the campaign even started. And in some measurement pe periods, greater use of, of uh, cannabis was associated with higher frequency of exposure to the ads. The pr prevention program was a massive failure. Uh, it, it, it was inexplicable. This is not new, however. I've drawn a chart. We, we, we watch uh, cannabis use in grades 8, 10, and 12, for example, have done so oh, for many years. I took the last 20 years or so, 21 years, and charted out the usage rates of these children in different grades. If you add six to each of these numbers, you'll figure out about the uh, average age of the children. So uh, children in the eighth grade of our of our uh, elementary schools is uh, is approximately 14 years old, 16 and 18 in the 12th grade. As you see, despite millions of dollars, billions of dollars being spent on prevention, the general form of these of these uh, usage rates in the three grades is flat. It, it hasn't had much of an effect at all, except in the last year. And that is kind of strange because that that usually this big drop has never occurred before in the whole history of this of this nationwide data collection effort on, in in the United States. And you'll notice that this happens to be the time of COVID. And when COVID uh, uh, pandemic was rearing its ugly head in our country, a lot of schools literally shut down and all schooling was conducted online, which meant the kids were home all day, uh, at least during the school day. And in many cases, their parents were as well. So the children and the, 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 the children were being heavily monitored because they were all living in the same place with their parents uh, entire days. And so consequently, what you find is a massive drop, at least in, in well, in all three years, unheard of before in the history of this data collection effort. And it's all had to do with parents being around, okay? That should tell you something about the effectiveness of parental monitoring, but don't overdo it because there are some limits on the utility of monitoring in, in terms of what it can do for you. Uh, well, we haven't succeeded, let, let's admit it, but does it matter? And I think, yes, it does, because marijuana use or cannabis use, as it's more widely known, has all of these problems associated with it. We've had our National Academy, the best scientists in the country, psychologists and physiologists, study this issue and put out a book on it. It's free. You can get it yourself if you want to, if you want to download it. And the ones I want to say, all of the stuff we already knew in white that, I, that I'm showing you. Um, you might not know that addiction, that, that today's cannabis, at least in the U.S., is so strong that it can cause addiction with heavy use. Uh, and we know that in addiction meaning uh, withdrawal symptoms, uh, craving, and so forth. It was never this way before, but we've developed much more powerful strains and ways of, of making the, the drug more powerful. 
uh, and it has and, and it takes an effect, as you can see from this this statement here. Um, but the major ones that really start to worry me is that there is a strong relationship of higher usage of, of uh, dangerous drug use in adulthood after using marijuana and even nicotine. But it's marijuana or cannabis we're talking about here. And it also happens to interfere with heavy use in youth with brain development. Normal brain development takes about 25 years for most of us, okay, before you finally get your brain together. Uh, if you start smoking this stuff heavily at age, let's say, 16, you can stop development, which means at 40 years old, you're going to have the, the reasoning power or the, the judgment of a 16-year-old. Some of you know people like this, uh, but it is not a particularly charming uh, uh, outcome. So this is what I'm really concerned about, is this, this, this drug does not help you and it actually can cause major problems for you in your later life. Why have we failed? Well, we tend to use, we like to use the mass media for all sorts of good reasons. The mass media can reach places that are very, very difficult to, 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 uh, to arrive at. You, you, uh, villages, towns, isolated, relatively isolated in every other way, except the media, and you can get to them. Uh, I think almost every kid on earth almost has a smartphone or at least a heavy representation of that. So you don't really have to be anywhere if you're transmitting information uh, through the airwaves to that's those phones. But we don't understand that when we use the mass media. We don't understand what they're designed to do and what they're not designed to do. And that is a major problem for us. We also fail to understand the nature of persuasion, what we have to do to induce people to adopt our advice, especially when they don't want to, especially when it's contrary to what they want to do or what they already believe. We have put an enormous amount of effort on trying to inform people about things, about the dangers of drugs and so forth. In many cases, you don't need to do it. If you talk to a smoker, most smokers know this is not good for my for my health. They know it. You, you don't need to inform them about this. It's already known. But what you have to overcome is resistance. Yes, it's bad for my health, but my uncle Charlie smoked for 90 years and he never quit, and et cetera, et cetera. All right. That's a that's a tactic of resistance that lots of smokers use. Or apathy. Well, I don't care. Okay, you just lay back and don't don't bother with this stuff. Or a failure to understand how these features interact. How do we integrate the reach and immediacy of the media with our understanding of persuasion? Why do I keep saying persuasion? Because to me, all prevention, almost all prevention, involves persuasion. In almost every case, prevention says, let me try to tell you why you shouldn't do something that you want to do or that you're thinking about doing or that your friends are doing, okay? Uh, that, that takes persuasion. I have to get you on board. I have to get you to accept my arguments. Just giving you information doesn't do it because there's so many ways of avoiding information, of, of basically saying yes, but, yes, but, and that's the end of persuasion. And so what we have to do then when we try to persuade someone is give them the strongest, most powerful evidence that we can in the most persuasive way. Okay, so persuasion to me is the essence of prevention. If, you, if you're not persuasive, you're probably not gonna prevent people from doing anything they wanna do. Okay, so what are the essential features of mass media or media in general, really? What are media best designed to do? I talk about mass media, but it, it's, it's it's everything. It's it's social media. It's radio. It's TV. It's for a teacher talking to a, to a group of students. I consider that media. Okay. What the what the what the media are best designed to do is engage people, to instruct people, and to persuade people. In a prevention context, a substance prevention context, using media to develop a to deliver a, a, a message, a persuasive message needs to use all three of these, along with a process that questions 
and undermines established pro-substance attitudes, if they already exist in the person's mind. If you ignore any of these three, uh, you're, you're going to fail. And it's easy to fail. It's much more, it's much harder to really get all of this stuff into one message, uh, but it's certainly been done. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So what are critical features of persuasive communications? What have to they, what must they do? My statements today are based on research that started intensively in the late 50s, 1950s, and have gone into the 2020s and beyond intensively. The, the, these are, this is a compilation of what I know, and I've been somehow consumed by this literature for almost that amount of time. I came in a little bit after the 50s, not much later, and I've been really uh, addicted to this literature. Okay. So here's what, I've, here's what I find works. First of all, you have to prepare yourself. You have to assume that your audience is going, is going to want to resist you. You're telling somebody to not do something that they're thinking of doing or maybe wanting to do or that all the, or, or that all their friends are doing. Most of my work has been focused on youth and young adults, okay, 18 to uh, 12 to, I don't know, 30, something like that. Uh, so that includes uh, adolescents and young, young adulthoods. In every case, when I deal with a prevention context, I run into resistance. In my laboratory, I have a big sign as soon as you come through my door. It says, expect resistance. I don't mean that as a, as a mean thing to visitors, but rather for my students to understand that they're in a situation where people are not instantly going to accept everything they say or maybe anything they say. Okay, so let's talk about how we accomplish three crucial functions. This is based on work of the great Carl Hovland Way back in 1957, he came out with a wonderful book. I still read it uh, when I need inspiration. First of all, what, what, is a, what is a function of a persuasive message? The first thing it has to do is to raise a question about the advisability of an action or an attitude or a belief that you have. And to undermine that answer with a strong communication that's difficult to counter argue, to resist. In other words, every, every counter that you come up with in your mind, the message that you're presenting says, no, nah, that's wrong because of this. Okay, so he says, and I believe it's true, that what you're doing is engaging with, in a debate, an internal debate that the person is having. You're telling me to do this, and I wanna do this instead. How can I maintain my belief, my attitude, and overcome your, your message? In some ways, it's very difficult to do if the message is very strong, fact-based, and so forth, or presented by a person that I love and, and admire and, and, and listen to on every other issue. You have to provide information that answers the question. I raise the question, I answer it, relieving the stress of behavioral disconfirmation, and I reinforce acceptance of the message. How do I do that? Well, let's say you're a a soccer fan, or I guess you guys call it a football fan. And there's a great star that you just love. He's on your favorite team, and he's he's won every possible prize award that, that's, that's possible. And he comes on TV one day and says, I've been asked to talk to you about cannabis. I don't know much about cannabis because I've never used it. Because if I did, I wouldn't be a successful athlete. And if you want to do this, if you want to become a successful athlete, you shouldn't use it either. If I'm a young youngster listening to that man, and that man is one of my heroes, I'm going to have a strong reason to accept what he has to say. To enhance effectiveness, and this gets back to who we're talking to, you target or tailor the message to the unique susceptibilities of the group or individual that you are dealing with. So if I'm talking to a, a, a group of soccer fans, children who are adolescents who are really extremely interested in athletics, I, I'm going to use 
a message source that they like, that they will listen to. Okay, I know those, we're, we're talking to a number of different countries, so those, those uh, athletes might be different uh, people, you might have different favorites, but you use who it is that you're talking to as an indication of who you should use as a, uh, as a spokesperson. Okay, that's very simple to do. I mean, all you got to do is think about it for a second and say, oh, yeah, okay, my, my kid loves so-and-so. He'll listen to whatever he says. You have to choose, though, uh, the, the right spokesman because you don't want them two weeks later to be arrested for drug use. Okay, let's forget about that. So how do we put together all of these phases of, of, uh, of messaging, of creating a message? that makes it possible for you to not have to read the past 50 years of literature to figure out what, what I should do. This was a problem that I ran into in a lot of my earlier years when I was talking about persuasion, in that the literature is so gigantic and there's so much advice out there, it's not conflicting as a matter of fact, but, but still advice that you need to follow if you want to succeed. And there's so many things that the question always was, well, okay, I learned, I know all this, this material, but how do I put it together? So my group and I worked on this for a while and, and uh, tested it out, tested different approaches. And we've come up with this thing, which in English, equip model the, is an algorithm. It equips the, each of these letters in equip, uh, at least the way we spell it, um, means it's an operation that you need to follow if you're going to create a persuasive message. It is our feeling and research that we've done on this model that if you skip one or another of them, you lose a game. Your message doesn't, doesn't work nearly as effectively and sometimes it doesn't work at all. It doesn't, present, doesn't uh, make, uh, make a good uh, uh, outcome for you. So what is the equip model? What does the equip model stand for? Uh, let me, uh, hold, hold on a second. I have to close my door. I've forgotten about this. Okay, I'm back. What does the equip model stand for? The E in equip stands for engage. If you don't attract and maintain the attention of your audience, you are officially dead. You can't persuade anybody if they're asleep if they're not listening, if they're not watching, okay? Or if halfway through your presentation, they say, ah, oh, this is terrible, I'm gonna go have a coffee or something. That is not what I just did. I closed the door because my wife was in the other room talking on the phone. Okay, so engage. Question. One of the first things you have to do in the presentation of a persuasive communication is raise a question in the minds of the receiver about the attitude or intention that they hold. Just a question, not arguing, nothing like that. Just, oh, so you 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 think that uh, cannabis is 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 not uh, a threat to your health. Just a question. Now there's an implication in the question because what it does is cause the person to realize not everybody believes the same thing that I do or else they wouldn't be asking me the question. One of the bolsters that we use to bolster our attitudes is, and our, especially our important attitudes, the ones that we care about, is everyone believes this or everybody who I know who I care about believes this. If you raise that question, really, uh, you, you, you think this? It begins to chip away at that assumption of consensus. And with young people, people at least, with adolescents, that is, a, that is a first major step toward persuasion. You follow up that question with undermining, which is a destabilizing the belief. Oh, you think that? Well, gee, there's quite a bit of evidence that uh, doesn't agree with you. And then you inform. Because that destabilization really starts putting into place forces of change. Information then 
is much more readily absorbed by your audience or by your the person you're talking to than without that preliminary those pre preliminary steps. And the final part of the equip model, the persuade, or the P is persuade. What are incentives that you can offer for agreement with your message? Well, um, might be agreement with, uh, well, a, a great source of information has just told me this. A guy who I really care about or a woman I really care about who, who is my ideal, my role model, and one or the other of them has said, you shouldn't do this because of this or this or this. Or it might be the information that is presented is presented as uh, showing the science of it. We've used this before in college student samples where we say, here's the scientific evidence for this. Just look at it. We're not asking you to change your mind about anything, but just consider it. When you do this, and that group is attuned to science, to scientific evidence, you have provided uh, an incentive for them to agree with you. Oh, the science says this. Gee, I didn't really know this uh, it, it, as much. I've been listening to my friends who don't know any more than I do about this. Okay. Now, as I said before, this model assumes resistance. It assumes that you have to overcome the problem. Okay. That people are sort of moving toward usage if they're not already. What it doesn't do is take a person who is substance use dependent and fix them. Okay, that is not what the media does. Mass media are not good at treatment. And when I see them being used as trying to treat people who are addicted to a substance, it, I, I throw my hands up in the air. I say, this is, this is not what the media can do. It's not, not the proper function, okay? We work best on prevention. That's what the media does. That's where we're good. Can face-to-face -face work uh, in a clinical setting work in, in terms of prevention? Of course it can. It's probably better than using media, but it also costs a thousand times more. Okay, and you can't really do it at a community level or even at a school level. Okay, so we assume resistance. The Equip model also integrates the functions critical in persuasion that we have learned about over 50 years of hard trying. It assumes that the pr proper audience is targeted, that the message is, is relevant to the people you're talking to. I mean, the, all of this is, is fairly simple. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't talk about uh, high energy physics to a group of school children in the, in the third grade. It's, it's probably not going to work very well. Okay. And it supplies a framework for people in our field to guide media-based substance prevention. It provides a framework for creating persuasive messages. It takes all of that material we've learned over 50, 60, 70 years and says, okay, here's how you step through it. This is how to do it. And so far it's been very, very successful for us. Here's an ad, this was a signature ad of the National Anti-Drug Media Campaign in the U.S. It's an old ad, but it's one that almost everyone my age and maybe even in the prior, uh, the next generation remembers. Okay, this was the ad. It was an anti-cannabis ad. Uh, I'd like you to watch it. Okay, last time. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Now let's look at that ad. That was a very popular ad. They played it all the time on TV, radio, you name it. And it inspired about a thousand uh, alternative films or videos of this is your brain on eggs or this is your egg on brain. It 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 was the, the, the subject of uh, a huge amount of discourse and so forth. But let's, let's, let's grade this ad in terms of the equip uh, uh, a scorecard and see what we, we've got. Uh, okay, the first thing we ask is, did it engage people? Yeah, it did, it attracted people's attention, people were talking about it, 
uh, they got tired of it because it was overused. Incidentally, if you're going to use mass media to try and present something or prevent something like uh, substance use, don't think that one one presentation is going to do it for you. You do need multiple presentations. You do keep have to keep presenting up to the point where people get tired of it. And then you come in with a new ad. You, you, but trying just one ad and, and, and hoping it's going to solve a strong intention of a person to, to start using a, a substance, it, it, that, that's magic. That's not, that's not science. Okay, question. Did it raise a question in viewers' minds? I don't think so. Did it threaten an existing belief and provide an alternative? No, you see an egg frying. Did it tell you how to avoid, in terms of inform, did it tell you how to avoid frying your brain? No. It didn't. The implication was there, don't do this stuff. But it didn't tell you what to do or how to do it, right? Your ads have to have to give information. This is why you shouldn't do that. If you have the problem, it, 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 and, and if you do have the problem, here's a, here's a place, a, a logo or something where you can, or a URL on the screen that you can hit, and we have a, a people talking to you or helping you or giving you or giving a, or providing a, a information about what to do, what not to do, how to avoid things. Was it persuasive? No, it's telling me to avoid a drug, but not how to do so or why I should, and it will not succeed, according to the equip, and it didn't. Everyone talked about this ad, okay, which admin really like, okay? If you're in marketing, you want people to talk about your product. Did it persuade anyone to buy your product or to accept the information? No. Everyone remembers that this is your brain on drugs ad. But there's a difference. So don't get seduced by memorability. Everyone remembers this ad. It's memorable. But it wasn't persuasive. It didn't, didn't do what it wanted to do or what its, what its developers wanted it to do. It engaged people. It did the first part of the equip, and that was about it. Okay. So let's not beat that horse to death. Here's another ad that might, that I think does work better. It has many of the idea. It could be improved because it's hard to, they did this before the equip came out. It could be improved. Uh, but I, I think uh, if we can show it now, we'll be in good shape.
All right. Um, let's see. I want to I want to go to the next slide. I guess. Okay. Um, this ad that I just showed you was wildly effective when it was used, when it was targeted to adolescents, 12 to 18, so somewhere in there, maybe a little bit older than 12. Because it did most of what we wanted uh, the equip to do for us. It was, uh, it was ironic, which uh, adolescents like, at least American adolescents, I won't, won't presume that everyone does. It had an interesting uh, uh, song going along with it. And it presented really, in a sense, really frightening information in a way that was acceptable, in a way that it, it didn't threaten you, but in fact, it did get through. We assume people, <coughs> excuse me, don't always believe what they're told, especially when dealing with, with, uh, with substances, uh, addictive substances. We call this resistance, obviously. Then overcoming resistance, if that's the case, is one of the major jobs of a persuasion, of a positive, a preventive persuasion effect or per persuasive preventive effect. We think we know how to do it. The literature fits with our work, as does the uh, outcome of this ad. It was catchy, it was fun, people talked about it. You do want that sort of buzz going around on your uh, communications, on your persuasive messages. You want your audience to talk about it with other people uh, and to get other people to see it and to listen to it. But if you don't, uh, and if you don't, you, you're not gonna have a huge effect. But if you can get that buzz going and also get some acceptance, of that information, you have practically won the persuasion game, okay? So given this, here's what we try to do. We try to make resistance difficult or impossible or apparently unnecessary. We target, again, we get the message to the right audience. If you don't, you're wasting your time and your money. And when we're dealing with adolescents, we always try to engage parents. And I have, I can't tell you all of the studies that we've done on effects of parents on uh, their offspring's drug use or drugs to say, or drug resistance, but there are many of them and parents play an exceptionally important role. Here's some early research I'm gonna to talk to you about. We divide receivers into three types, resolute non-users. These are, these are uh, people who say, I've never used this substance, I never will. Or vulnerable non-users. I've never used this substance, they're non-users. Will you ever? I don't know, probably not. If we don't get it, definitely not, never will then we put you into the vulnerable category. We don't use sociodemographic information to say you're vulnerable. We don't say, well, you're poor, so you're vulnerable. We don't say, well, you're, uh, you're in the minority uh, group, so you're, no, nah, those, those factors don't, don't predict much for us. But this idea of whether they just said, no, I'll never do this, even though many will, uh, that makes a difference and difference in terms of what kinds of messages they will accept and will they, will, what they won't, and how you ought to structure messages in order to get it, uh, depending on which one of these groups you're, you're trying to target. We, this, is usual, this is different from the usual treatment approach, where in treatment, you try to divide people into groups. Well, they're experimenters, they're, they you know, try this drug every, every now and then, or maybe on weekends, or they're established, they, they have a system, uh, that, you know, they do it every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they use this drug, or they're addicted or substance use dependent. 
in cessation, we need to distinguish users on the base of their substance use dependency. And probably, and I don't deal with with uh, with, with treatment. I don't, I don't know anything about it. Well, I know something about it, but I don't do it. Probably different messages work better depending on the person's degree of dependency. Our division reflects our focus on prevention. It is easier to prevent initiation than to treat dependency, much easier and much less costly. And the return on the investment is probably five times that of the return on, on, on treatment. I'm not saying don't do treatment, obviously you have to. But what I'm saying is uh, the amount of resources given to prevention in my country and worldwide is trivial re relative to what we're putting into treatment. It seems to me if we can prevent more people from becoming dependent, uh, we've made a wise choice. Our approach, we follow the equip model. We were called into a school because they were worried about the children in the school using inhalant drugs. Inhalants are very dangerous. They're, they're the things that you can find in almost anywhere, which is one of the dangers. They're there. Uh, your father's butane lighter, if you hold it upside down and click it, you get a lot of butane and you can get high from it. The, the gasoline you can get high from, it's not good for you. None of this stuff is, it can kill you. So we tried to find out why kids were doing this. We went into the school as we always do if we're going to mount a campaign then talk to the audience we talked to little kids they were probably sixth seventh and eighth grade let's say 12 13 14 year olds and some of them were coming in with suspiciously looking as, as if they had used some inhalant drugs sometimes that is a white foam around your mouth sometimes it's just dizzy or banging around so we wanted to figure out how we could deliver an inhalant prevention message to kids 11 to 14 years old. And we divided them into users, uh, resolute non-users, vulnerable or users. We gave them a, so we prevented them uh, with a source of information, a spokesperson who was an attractive high school student, or we had her dressed as a medical doctor. We filmed her in a in an emergency room with wearing her scrubs and a and a stethoscope. We, we I'm in near LA, and so and my son is in the film uh, industry uh, business, and so it was easiest to get an actor, a good actor, uh, and to get the, the proper sets that we needed. And we looked at the parent target of the communication: parents or adolescents. What this means is. Who did this source present the message to, even though the only audience was school children? We call this misdirection. If I'm talking to, if I really want to present a prevent usage in a kid, and I say to start my message with parents, I need to talk to you about something. You say, why would you do that? Why I would do that is because it, it reduces the amount of or the extensiveness of resistance on the part of the adolescent audience. Why should I argue with you if you're talking to my mother? So here's the way that the, the study went. They, uh, let's see how much time I've got. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, child is in this classroom. These classrooms had TV sets at the front where teachers on occasion would play things. We created a movie on bullying children being mean to other children in the, in the classroom. The school wanted that. We, we have actors, actors and so forth. 15, it's a 15 minute uh, video and the teacher said, okay, now we're gonna look at this film, children. So sit back and watch. And it was this film. 10 minutes into the film, we cut away for, it, for, a, for a message from your, from a, a, a commercial, a commercial message from your sponsors. Not unusual, it's the way this stuff works. And we, ripped an ad off the internet about computers, buy our computers are the best thing. And then we came across with this young woman talking about things. And she either said to half the class classes that she uh, addressed, this was on TV, students, I'd like to talk to you today about an important issue and the message attacked illicit, illicit substance use, in this case, illicit uh, uh, use of uh, inhalants. 
Or she said to a different class of people, all this is all randomly assigned kids to different groups. Uh, parents, I'd like to talk to you today about an important issue. And the middle school youth, the kids in this experiment were significantly more persuaded by the parents ad, even though everything after that word was the same. Everybody saw and heard the same thing, except it was directed at the students themselves or at their parents. Why is that? Because they didn't resist the message. Why would you resist a message that somebody's telling your mother about, giving to your mother? If you're, if you're an 11 year old, you, you're just gonna listen, but you're not gonna fight it. Uh, other, other campaigns have done similar things. An Arizona anti-smoking campaign, they talked about secondhand smoke, they directed it to the parents. It worked on the parents, but it worked even better on the adolescents who are listening in. Uh, national the national uh, campaign run in this country where parents, the anti-drug, it worked. It was based on, our, our, on this study. Uh, why did it work? Well, they thought because we taught parents what to do. Yeah, part of that, but also kids were watching. And they were, and the ads were telling what is wrong with this, with uh, this drug, why it shouldn't be used, why you should tell your kid not to do it, and so forth. And the kids were were listening. They weren't, they weren't counter arguing. They weren't fighting it. We did a meta analysis of 17 studies. We took 17 studies that all looked at the same thing, put it all together, and what we found was parental monitoring. This is why I talked about parents earlier. That parental monitoring makes a huge difference. If you watch your kids. Carefully, it's going to make a difference. We also found that it worked, real monitoring worked, had a stronger effect on girls than boys. Correlation of 30, 31, that is the more uh, uh, monitoring, the less marijuana use. Okay, that's why these minus signs are here in girls and in boys. Stronger when the monitoring was this, this is important, was defined in terms of knowledge. That is, how do you know what your kid is doing? We had questions in there and said, well, we know what our kid was doing because he or she told us what they were doing. So that suggests to me a tight parent-child bond, a warmth, that kids, if they're afraid of what you're gonna do, oh, sorry, I thought I had this turned up. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, if, that shouldn't have rung. <laughs> if you have a, a, a parent who is monitoring you very carefully, but doing it coldly, parent is mean to the child. They know everything you're doing because I'm watching you like a hawk. It doesn't work. In fact, it works very in the opposite way. These results were quite strong. The, the statistic that we did showed us that in order to knock out these effects, which are highly statistically significant, you need about 7,300 studies of nil effects, of no effects whatsoever, to render these results non-significant. You're not going to do that. You're not going to find those. We looked at try to tried to use a data set where we looked at what happens when you have problems at home. Okay, again, the parents are split up or maybe a parent has died. And this can be a real problem. We use this to, to create a statistical model. Don't, don't worry about the complexity of this. We, we looked at uh, We looked at family income, mother family, dual family. Please take this phone and get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and whether the this child was a boy or a girl. What we found is that even parents, even families that were had only one versus one parent, uh, a father only or, or a mother only, all of them, oops, all of them were monitoring the child very closely. Um, but these factors had nothing to do with parental warmth. In other words, it didn't matter if it was a father-only family. It didn't make a difference between father-only versus dual parent families and so forth. Um, so these are the things that we're looking at, parental monitoring and parental warmth, because we had measures of warmth. Parental monitoring had a negative effect on children's attitudes toward drugs. That would, that's what we mean by social. It had, parental warmth had a negative uh, impact on interpersonal relationships. That is, your, if, if your parents were warm and, and uh, listening to what you had to say, 
you are much less likely to 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 befriend ch ch other children who are who were going to get you into trouble. And these these variables also worked. Uh, monitoring also worked on friendship choice, as did parental warmth on social attitudes. These factors, social attitudes, a year later, along with interpersonal friendships, a year later, had strong impacts, negative impacts on substance use. So the parents had a huge effect on whether the child was going to graduate in the next year. All of them started out non-users in year one. In year two, some of them had started, and these variables uh, predicted them very nicely. Here's another very complex looking graph, but it isn't. Here we were looking at parental warmth, parental alcohol use, and parental control. Parental control is watching the kid very carefully. There are a couple of things I want to show you. Parental control, just purely watching a kid, uh, makes it uh, somehow is related to their perception that it's easier to get access to alcohol. This is an alcohol study. Parental alcohol use did as well, and parental warmth had a negative effect. So if the parental, had, if the parent had a warm, warm impact with his children, with her children, his or her children, they thought getting alcohol would be harder to use, and that would have a negative impact on the use of, on children's use itself. Parental use perceptions also. Adolescent use, this, so now we're going across the years. This was across 14 years. This is a big study that we have in the US. Taking the same parents and kids year by year by year for 14 years. Adolescent use, high school, was a causal agent of binge drinking in college. Binge drinking in college was, was significantly related to the presence or absence of that former kid, now an adult, having an arrest record. Alcohol, parent, parent alcohol use has a direct effect on that. Parents' use perception, if your kid, if you think your kid is using and act that way, that has an effect. If the perceptions are my kid uses a lot, that then leads to this, and then this. What I'm trying to show you is parents have an enormous impact on what happens to their kids in terms of substance use. Parent alcohol use, direct effect. Okay, so if you get drunk in front of your kids, you're going to cause yourself some trouble down the road. So what, what prevention specialists and policymakers should do? What should they do to mount a successful campaign? I say the first principle is work to overcome resistance to your appeals. Use the, use the equip model. Engage your audience. Question existing attitudes. Undermine the answer. Inform and persuade. If you can do those things, uh, and I wish you were in my 16-week class. We could teach you pretty well how to do it. Uh, you're going to succeed. Don't overpromise. Don't overthread. We, we tend to you like to use fear arousal because we think, boy, this is going to scare people and they'll never do this stuff. It doesn't work. We've got about 50 years saying, don't do this unless you do it precisely right. And it's really, I, and even I've been doing this for many, many years. It's hard for me to do these things. I don't use them anymore. I don't use fear arousal because it usually fails. And when it fails, it makes the next guy, the next persuasion attempt less likely to succeed because you reinforce the attitude well, I'm right. I was able to fight back this, this uh, persuasive message. Unbelievable ads often result in future failures, okay, because they generate stronger resistance. Target your audience. Don't have a dancing bear try to persuade a teenager not to use marijuana. It's stupid. It won't work, even though we spent a lot of money trying it. For youth campaigns, involve parents as opinion leaders if possible. If not possible, make it possible. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I guess we have some questions that I will yeah. try. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so so much, Dr. Crano, for uh, this uh, amazing uh, webinar. Are you able to hear me? Let's see. What do I want to do? There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have uh, we have received a lot of questions. However, due to uh, the time limitation, we'll be asking some of them. 
I will start by a question from uh, one of uh, our attendees from Ukraine. Okay. Uh, he or she is asking that during the fighting or war, the amount of drug use among different groups increase. How to convey preventive messages through the media during the war? Are there any special features? And thanks. I don't think it's a special feature. I think your your job is harder, but I think the the uh, tactics that we've laid out are going to work as well. The difficulty will be: can you get to the audience? Can you can you get an audience where uh, where you can understand what are the features of this audience? How do I target a message to their particular uh, issues? You, you yeah, it's it's I, I know you're in a very difficult situation. We've been all watching it from this country intensely, and and uh, but I, I I don't think there's anything special about the techniques of persuasion that you would use. Just that it would be harder to it may be harder to get an audience together of similar backgrounds and, and beliefs and, the, uh, and attitudes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Crano. The second question is regarding if the equip model has been tested in low and middle income countries. Uh, and, there is an, uh, and there is another question linked if it has been applied with a focus on tobacco products, uh, which I think you, you already covered. But regarding the low and middle income countries, uh, do you have, a, should we have another approach or it's the same approach? And what about the results of the studies in, in these countries? Okay, We're, we've been supported by the US State Department to present this kind of training uh, to a number of countries, to well, a number of countries in uh, Central Europe, Eastern uh, Eastern Europe, um, South America, Central America, and so forth. We've had three. I think we're in our fourth year now of training people on this on our pre prevention approach. Um, the and and we're right now in a, in, in uh, involved in actually consulting with people who are running these programs. Um, they've been tried in some preliminarily tried in uh, earlier. They do seem to work. Uh, some people in the Philippines have, have reported really good good results. It's hard to get a, pre a prevention campaign going because they do cost a little bit. Sometimes not very much, but especially if you're using social media. Um, but the, the the answer is uh, you're about a year early on that question because in, in a year we will have probably at least eight or nine discrete countries in Europe and in in the in the uh, Americas that have been that have used this approach. We've done it, of course, in our own play and our own uh, research, and that's and and we've been almost you know, almost always successful. Thank you so much. Uh, the third question is what mass media can be the most effective to obtain results in terms of prevention of alcohol consumption? Well, uh, who, who's your audience, I guess, is my first question. And the second question is, what medium do they use? So if you're dealing with kids, at least in the US, you're dealing with Instagram, TikTok, things like that. If you're dealing with their parents, you're using Facebook, because kids don't use Facebook here. And in many other countries, I've learned. And so you need to target the audience. And one of the things that goes into the targeting is what medium do they use? So you need to know that. But that, but that that's not terribly difficult to, to figure out, to find out. Uh, I, I believe this session was really engaging because we are still receiving a lot of questions. And I'm really sorry that I won't be able to cover all of them. Uh, someone asked about the importance of the call, call to action. As you mentioned during your presentation, there were uh, a part where we should see if there is a call to action after this, um, after this ad, this, uh, this media message, because sometimes it's easy for us to identify uh, the problem, the issue, the challenge. However, the call to action is really critical because sometimes we are not able to uh, to, to to deliver the, the call to action. Yeah. 
Yeah, we we have this. This is a constant problem. What you, to my mind, the word that I would use is how do you evaluate the effectiveness of a campaign? How do you know it worked? In some ways, it's pretty easy. Like if you're doing a, 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 a an ad a, 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 on social media, you can have. If you need more information, click this. Click this URL. And you can count it. And you could say, well, whoa, we got 400 responses in the first hour after this thing was done, or this happened, or this happened. And but of course, you have to have the information <laughs> available to send to people or to or for them to download. It's that sort of thing. Evaluation is a very tough process. Almost nobody who funds research gives you money to evaluate it, which is sort of crazy because they expect you to tell them, yeah, this worked or yeah, it didn't. But evaluation is difficult. But it's it's it, it really depends on what medium you're using and how, how you're doing it. So in, in our case, for example, we're looking at, it, it, we've got a lot of projects in California, we're looking at drug use rates among a specific age of children in the state from one year to the next after we've uh, broadcast our stuff. And uh, it, that takes some infrastructure that some places don't have. They don't have a, a way where you can, gather that information easily. So you have to come up, you have to be creative to figure out how can I get info as to whether I'm getting across and whether it's making a difference. And those questions are really, really important. And they're also very, very hard to answer uh, because they take uh, money usually or time. Okay, the last question and apologies because we are running out of time. Uh, I will, I will allow myself to ask this question. It's regarding now the, the huge campaigns that we are seeing about bullying. And I believe that we are facing the same challenges that was faced with the drugs and tobacco messages before uh, uh, 30, 40, uh, even till now we are facing a lot of negative campaigns about, uh, about tobacco and scaling campaigns. Now we are facing some challenges with the bullying campaigns as we are uh, showing the the bully as uh, as a very negative person however we know that it's he's a victim or she's a victim as well how can you provide if please you can you provide us with some tips uh, how to address this topic because it is linked as a like a risky behavior yeah um we we tried this with our um, anti-bullying uh, message that we created. Um, my one of my colleagues, who was the the sort of the the film master, uh, shot this film, and my son directed it. He's a director uh, in uh, Hollywood, and and uh, was, and we tried to build in issues of equip into it. And we, it, it, I'd be happy to if I. If, I, if he's got it, I, I'll be happy to send it to you. And you can you can have a look. Uh, you can see how we did it or what we tried to do. And it, it's nice because it didn't, this, this was not using any actors. It was mostly a script and pretty pictures and scenery and so forth. But it captured kids' attention, which is what we tried to do. And then it delivered some things about not saying don't do this or else, but but really pointing out the the problems that bullying can cause and what it what it can do. We didn't really get into how you respond to a bully much in this film, but we hope because we were delivering it just that, that our target was bullies, uh, not the kids being bullied. And uh, I I will ask him uh, to send me the, the the clip, and I will send it to you. And, Amazing. Okay. The, the point is what you have to do is come in with using equip, try and get the people's attention and then talk about bullying, what it does, why it shouldn't be done and so forth. Not in a threatening way, but rather these are the, these are the problems that it causes and it causes it to, to everyone, not just the kid who's getting bullied, but to the bully too. Then I believe that after this session, equip model can be used in, uh, in our uh, campaigns either for uh, uh, drugs or other risky behaviors. I think it can, yeah. I mean, this, anything that involves you trying to persuade someone to do something that they, or not yeah. to do something they like to do, uh, maybe it, I think it's useful there. Amazing. Dr. William Crano, it was a really amazing session with you, full of knowledge, 
and uh, the engagement was amazing in the questions then uh, apologies because we were not able to cover all the questions uh, it was a great pleasure for us having you on board thank you for your time and uh, thank you for uh, providing us with this session and i know it's really too early in your country uh, <laughs> thank you for your time thank you for your uh, knowledge shared with us and thank you for your presence and definitely this session uh, will be as as i mentioned at the beginning it is recorded and will be posted on isaac website That's thank great. you so much, thank for you very much. Thanks for having me and uh, uh, call me again sometimes it's been a pleasure <laughs> Sure, sure, definitely. It it will be always it it's always a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony. See you all later. Bye bye.